Our next talk uh, by Frank Bauer on using ARIS radio systems on ISS for HAMSI. Thank you, Diego. Got it. Can you guys on Zoom see it? What about now? Gotcha. It's on. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Bauer, KA3HDO. I'm the uh, executive director of uh, ARIS USA, and I also want to um, Recognize my co-author on this uh, presentation, Randy Berger. Is there a problem? Go ahead. WA0D, WA who is the Director of Engineering uh, for ARIS USA. And uh, I thank uh, Nathaniel and the whole HAMSI team for giving us this opportunity to talk about using amateur radio systems on ISS for HAMSI. There we go. Okay, so um, I don't know how much you all know, some of you know this extensively, what ARIS is. Uh, it stands for Image Radio on the International Space Station. And I think we're probably, uh, the, the biggest thing that people recognize that we do is give students an a 10 minute opportunity to talk to the astronauts on the International Space Station through Amateur Radio. It's a inspiring uh, and educational and, and, uh, um, and an engaging activity um, that starts about six to 12 months before the contact actually happens, that 10 minute contact, which is the pinnacle of what they do. But the big thing is they get a substantial amount of, um, of education of a lot of different things, including uh, space research, what's going on on space station, uh, space communications, um, radio science, technology, um, using amateur radio capabilities. And so, it all builds up to that. And the other thing, and Nathaniel talked about it earlier this morning about ham radio, is we're actually backup communications for the International Space Station. So we provide that emergency backup in case everything else fails. Okay, so relative to ARIS, we have three prime initiatives we do. And I, I mentioned and I focused in on the STEM or STEAM education activity we do with the students. And I didn't say this, but that starts from, uh, we can uh, accept schools and students all the way from kindergarten all the way up to um, uh, college age students, K through 16 is what we say. Um, the other two initiatives that are part of ARIS are spaceflight hardware development. So we develop our own hardware systems. We've been doing that for years with AMSAT over the, you know, uh, over 40 years, it's getting to be 40 years now because we started this on the shuttle program then on Mir and now on the International Space Station. And then the other aspect of this is space, human spaceflight operations, because we have to you know, coordinate all of these uh, events. So that gives you the overview of ARIS, but let's talk about uh, HAMSI from a different perspective. I mean, most of the HAM, well, pretty much HAMSI observations are pretty much done from the ground up. The International Space Station is at approximately 400 kilometers, or about 250 miles, right in the middle of the F layer, actually in the middle of the F2 layer. So um, what inspired me about this is many years ago in working with the first astronaut that in, in space that used ham radio, which was Owen Gary at W5 LFL, he kept talking about us wanting to do, he, him interested in us doing um, ionospheric experiments in space. And uh, because of the fact that we're in the middle of the, uh, of the ionosphere. So this is the challenge is what I'm going to show you next are the capabilities we have on space station, some of the current ones as well as some of the future ones, and uh, get, your th get you thinking about what potentially you all could bring to the table from a science experiment. Because th this activity that we do in ARIS includes uh, scientific exp uh, exp explorations. 
So we have this new initiative. Um, we call it ARIS 2.0. Um, basically, what we want to do is to inspire, engage, and educate students and lifelong learners. Now, what was said this morning, what, what is lifelong? Image radio is a lifelong learning activity. So we use that word purposely because we feel it's very important for hams to be able to experiment with our capabilities through QSOs as well as through regular experiments. And um, the other thing to recognize is we're on space station, but we're we're working. Our Airs 2.0 is all about providing more engaging capabilities on space station, but also to expand beyond space station. If you've been listening to some of the news uh, recently in the past few months, there are other commercial organizations that are going to be building space stations. We are actually working with one of them called Axiom. Right now, uh, we're going to be uh, working with some of their astronauts, they'll be coming to space station. But uh, and the other thing is that we've been working on a lunar capability, either on the Artemis missions or the lunar gateway or lunar landers. So what I wanted to cover in here were a couple areas that are initiatives in development, uh, which is the student mission control capability. We are using a Raspberry Pi, we're going to use a Raspberry Pi on board uh, to do that, as well as our, um, our AREX activity, which is amateur radio exploration, which is the development of systems for lunar. So I'm going to talk about what we have now, and then this is our future, and, and talk about where we're going uh, to, to give you the, uh, and then talk about some potential opportunities that might exist. But I'm sure you all have other ideas too. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about our on-orbit communications capabilities. And um, on Space Station, uh, we have been in three different locations on the International Space Station. We started in the FGB, the Zarya, um, because we had an antenna was readily available there. And then we deployed our own antennas next on the, the um, Russian service module and then on the, uh, on the Columbus module. Now, at this point, we are just operating the systems in Columbus and the... Uh, and the uh, service module. So our, our capabilities right now include uh, VHF and UHF uh, two-way voice, both in the Zarya, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the Zvezda, the, the uh, service module, or in the Columbus module. Um, we also have um, slow scan television events that we do. Uh, those are basic, basically, for those aren't, that aren't hams, uh, picture uplink and downlink capabilities. Uh, we have had, and we're going to have again, um, an S-band ham video downlink capability. And then uh, a number of different uh, digital modes, uh, pr primarily APRS. And so the hams uh, usually, when we do a school context, are about, we do about two of them a week um, on the order of, you know, of 80 uh, a year, if you will. Um, in between those 10-minute contacts, uh, we open the system up for the hams to use either our our UHF VHF voice repeater or APRS. And ultimately, we'll have both of them running in the two modules, one running APRS and the other one running the voice repeater. Now, from an infrastructure perspective, on the uh, Russian service module, we have four antennas located along the periphery of the, the uh, long service module. Right near the docking port, the centerpiece there is actually the docking port uh, on the service module. And you can see these things called WA1, WA2, WA3, and WA4. Um, three of them are have VHF, UHF antennas, S-band, L-band antennas on them. The fourth one has an HF antenna on it instead of the VHF, UHF. WA4 has that. Uh, the two, WA1 and 2, are downward looking, and WA3 and 4 are upward looking. This is a... a, a picture of one of our antennas on the service module. You can kind of see the, um, the brown um, uh, is the UHF VHF antenna. We have uh, an L-band, S-band antenna under that uh, radome. Uh, and they ha Glisser is a, uh, a Russian um, uh, television capability uh, that has been used and not used over the years. So this is basically was a hand installed. You can see this handrail clamp on the handrails around the periphery of the service module. Uh, this is, uh, if you look and you can see this uh, progress vehicle coming in for docking, and if you look up, you know, about a, um, 
45 degrees up, you can actually see our antenna out there. That's one of our, uh, that's the WA3 antenna. And then uh, this one shows our other two antennas. Well, this is WA3 and then uh, WA4. The WA4, you can see the big, long um, 10 meter quarter wave uh, dipole, I mean, uh, quarter wave uh, uh, vertical. And then this is, uh, shows all four of our antennas around the periphery of the service module. So that's the antennas on the service module. Let's, talk, let's uh, circle back over to the Columbus module. This is our VHF antenna. On the left uh, picture was uh, Randy Bresnick uh, installing that antenna on the uh, vehicle. And on the right is, uh, is a view of it um, through one of the cameras uh, later on after it had been installed. These antennas were installed before the Columbus module was launched. The two pictures on the, on the left here are, um, are pictures of the antenna. They're, they're basically patch antennas, as you can figure that out, um, that were um, uh, installed before flight. And on the right, in the red circle, are the two antennas on the, uh, on the surface of the Columbus module. So um, what we launched about two years ago is what we called our next generation interoperable radio system. Um, we call it next generation because it provides a foundational platform for the future. So what we have on there is a Kenwood uh, D710GA um, transceiver that um, supports all of the modes I described uh, before except for the S-band and L-band type uh, capabilities. And then our multi-voltage power supply was built so that we could install things and not have to worry about plugging into the NASA resources. We only have to plug in once into our power supply, and this power supply can work on the Russian and the U.S. side of the, uh, the vehicle. Russian uses 28, U.S. side uses 120 volt DC. And this is, you can see in the back there, um, the picture of the, uh, of the um, power supply with the, uh, the radio system on board. Um, what I'm going to show you next are some of the things that we're uh, planning on doing with this in the future. Uh, additional installations that can actually help in some of the, uh, um, the uh, ham side type of investigations. So we're in the process of developing, uh, we got a, uh, uh, we, I should say, the, the uh, ISS National Lab. Uh, got a National Science Foundation um, grant, and we are working uh, with uh, the University of Berkeley and uh, ARIS ourselves to build this student mission control project. It's a pilot uh, activity, and our activity on this is to build a, a Raspberry Pi system that we install with the radios we have on board to actually do, um, to do, to basically provide sensor data as part of this student mission control. That Basically, we're getting data that NASA has from space station as well as our data, feeding that in and then letting the students uh, play around with the, with the uh, telemetry. So the way this is, works is we've, we are developing the student on-orbit sensor system. We're using the Raspberry Pi. We're developing a, a hat that has a whole bunch of different sensors on it. And that'll interface to the Kenwood uh, D710 radio, get uh, uh, sent through our antennas down to the ground, um, either using our ARIS uh, certified ground stations, we have 12 of them around the, uh, around the world, SATNOG ground stations, as well as any uh, uh, students that are using our radio kit or any other SDR radio to pick up the telemetry data, shove it into our cloud, and then the student mission control server that's uh, at the University of Berkeley. So that's the concept there. Now what we're, we, we are doing, and this is still, we're just about ready to, to cut the boards on this, but uh, we've got a sensor suite uh, uh, with uh, several different sensors on board, uh, including a radiation detector, a cosmic ray detector, um, and then internal. This is inside the vehicle. Let me start with that statement. Um, and then temperature, pressure, humidity. Uh, we have a gyro and, and, uh, and actually a high, um, a, a very high, frequ or high frequency uh, microphone, audio microphone capability. And we're going to add software into this system to do other things like slow scan television. Um, this, you know, can be, re uh, we're at the point now where we're defining and uh, going to cut boards very soon. So if there's other ideas on different sensors that could actually help HamSci, that would be fantastic. So the way this is going to work is that um, uh, we're going to install basically what looks like a little CubeSat with uh, a bunch of boards on it. Uh, some 
some pies and a software defined radio, and uh, you know the pie will have our sensor hat also uh, with all of that information. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you that's on board is uh, uh, we worked with a, a university in Berlin, TU of Berlin, um, on an experiment where we have all these antennas, and he, uh, uh, Martin, brought a, um, a Lime SDR on board, which is now our, our, uh, our device, uh, to do spectrum uh, uh, analyses, or spectrum measurements, I should say, experiments on VHF, UHF, L-band, and S-band, where all of our antennas that we have in the Columbus module. This was done in the Columbus module. And um, one of the things we were looking at over the orbit was uh, basically heat maps of, uh, of uh, RF communications on the ground, uh, which is very interesting just from the perspective of seeing how that is from country to country as well as over, over time. So that was part of his PhD research. And as I said, this has been turned over to us, so this is another source of capabilities that we have on board space station. And so um, if you go back, if we go back to what the ARIS-20 vision is, the um, top uh, in, in white is what we have on board right now. We're developing this, um, this ARIS uh, uh, student on-orbit sensor system cube uh, to support a whole host of different capabilities. Um, um, and, and it can be linked with the, the uh, Lime SDR to do, you know, Marconista is what that uh, payload was called, uh, type of experimentation, as well as anything else, including, I put HamSci all through here. Um, we have Ham TV system that's gonna go back up um, probably within the year. And um, uh, that, that's an S-band capability that potentially um, uh, might ha have some kind of interest. And then we're in the process as part of our um, as part of our image radio exploration activities, uh, we're building a, um, uh, a prototype system that's uh, all digital uh, using a software-defined radio. And as I said, um, we are um, developing systems to fly uh, to lunar distances. And so pretty much my last important last two slides are ideas uh, as to what we could do with this. And so I, I was looking at HF, VHF, UHF uh, reception and transmission, doing radio propagation inside the, the, uh, the F layer. Uh, NASA has actually come to us and asked us about the solar eclipse and uh, whether we had some experiments we might want to do there. There might be some collaboration there. Um, all kinds of different things. Uh, propulsive maneuvers create a plasma cloud looking at uh, that kind of a situation. Um, and then uh, L-band and S-band transmissions uh, using uh, GPS or GNSS uh, uh, signals uh, to do that. And, and, and then I mentioned the radiation and, and cosmic ray de uh, detector. And then from a, um, a lunar mission perspective, the lunar plasma environment uh, is an interesting thing that uh, Actually, I'm looking at two from a different perspective, and even the lunar regolith uh, situation, and whether uh, that soil uh, produces multipath and, and how it impacts uh, the, the signals. And then some of the other things are very similar to what I described uh, on ISS. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that um, uh, we have on-orbit systems on board space station, and, uh, and actually even uh, being planned for lunar, that could facilitate HAMSI investigations. And our vision, 2 vision, um, encourages uh, science uh, investigations. So uh, we're interested in any kind of thoughts and opportunities. We wanted to thank our sponsors, uh, the ISS National Lab, NASA Space Communications Navigation, the ARDC organization, ARL Foundation, ARL and, A and AMSAT, and everything they've done to help us uh, grow this program from an education and a scientific uh, uh, perspective. And then I don't want to leave the stage without um, giving a shout out to, in memory of uh, two phenomenal giants that have helped ARIS over the years, and that includes Tom Clark, K3IO, and Bob Berninga, WB4APR. And that's it. Thank you, Frank.